There's a lot of talk about what to buy, when to buy, not much about when to sell, but it's a big deal. If you sell or don't sell for the wrong reasons, you could be leaving money on the table. Today, I'm going to cover the four signals that tell me when to sell income investments. We'll also look at why the price you paid and the yield you're receiving on that price can become a costly distraction. I covered this when to sell topic briefly back in May during a Q&A video. The question keeps coming up, so today we'll expand on it and also address yield on cost, which isn't as important as some people think it is. Ideally, I don't want to do much selling. I'm more of a collector of income investments. Unlike a trader, I'm not trying to buy low and sell high. That's easy to do in a rising market, which makes us feel kind of clever, but I don't want to rely on it to pay the bills. Before I retired, my investing was focused on growth, like most people, so I remember that mentality. Growth investors want to maximize the value of their portfolio. Maximizing returns means foregoing current income and embracing volatility because you have a paycheck to get you through a bear market. That's all in the past for me. Now my primary goal is to generate consistent income. My secondary goal is to grow that income faster than inflation. The selling decisions we'll look at today are sometimes necessary to serve those two goals. The first signal that may trigger a sale is if the yield falls too low. I'm looking for a yield of at least 8%, but I'll go below that if the distributions are growing consistently. For example, RQI was yielding more than 8% when I bought it. The distributions didn't go up, which is fine, but the price did. That means it's currently yielding down in the sixes. I sold RQI in August so that I could take those gains and buy investments with a higher yield to increase income. In hindsight, RQI went on to appreciate after I sold it, but it's okay. I'm not a trader. I don't know when the price will top. I'm optimizing for income, not capital gains. This yield history chart is a handy way to compare the current yield to its yield history. It came from Snowball, which I mostly use to keep track of my current and future income. I can visually rank my portfolio by current yield, see yield on cost, and know exactly when the next dollar will land in my account. There's a link in the description for a free trial and a discount. By the way, if you're new to the channel, I retired in 2017, and that's when I got serious about researching my investments in greater depth. And this channel is where I share what I learned. I mostly focus on stocks and funds paying consistent yields of 8 to 12%. And if you'd like a copy of my portfolio, it's called Armchair Insider. Link in the description. It's free. The second signal that may lead to selling is valuation. This one is less important than yield for an income investor, but that doesn't mean it should be ignored completely. Assessing valuation varies between asset types. So let's look at some examples. For a BDC, you can look at price to book, which compares the price of the stock to the assets of the company. Here, we're looking at three business development companies. These are private lenders that focus on lending to mid-size businesses. I like ARCC as a benchmark because it has a long history of paying a high yield. It's the largest BDC by far, and it doesn't experience much volatility. On this chart, we're comparing it to two High Flyers, Hercules Capital and Capital Southwest. Both are excellent BDCs, but they tend to trade at a premium. When things are going well, the market loves them. They also pay attractive yields above 9%. I'll put links in the description to reviews of all three of these BDCs. As an income investor, you could make a case for not selling the two High Flyers, just collect the yield and ignore the price action. And I'll admit that I do hold both of those in my portfolio and ARCC as I record this. But earlier this year, I trimmed back my position on the two high flyers because when the valuations get this high, the price volatility goes a little nuts. We can see that more clearly if we switch from the price to book chart to a simple price chart. When the market had a brief correction in early August, ARCC dipped slightly and HTGC dropped like a rock. The income was unaffected, fortunately, but it shows how sensitive the price is for HTGC to any bad news. When the valuation is at nosebleed levels, I'm just more comfortable holding a smaller position 
than a large one. To create these charts, I use the comparisons feature on Seeking Alpha. It's one of the four features I use the most as explained in that video there. I use Seeking Alpha pretty much every day, and that's a mix of checking up on current investments and researching new ones using the thousands of analysis articles. Obviously, I don't read all of them, but there are thousands to choose from. Pretty much, if you can name a stock or a fund that produces income, there'll be articles on Seeking Alpha. There's a link in the description for a free trial and a discount. I use the membership level called Premium. Now let's look at a closed end fund, similar concept, except this time we're measuring price to net asset value or NAV. ARDC is yielding just over 9%, nothing wrong with that, but I'm not the only one who likes it. The market has been buying up ARDC recently and it's trading at a price premium over its NAV of 3.58%. Now, typically that's not a huge price premium and I still hold ARDC in my portfolio, but it's important to take the information in the context of the fund's history. If we go back five years, ARDC has consistently traded at a discount to NAV. This premium thing is abnormal for this fund. If the NAV and the price were moving up together, that would be great, but the NAV is trading sideways while the price keeps going up. That trend can't go on forever. That's why I trimmed some of my ARDC in August. Last example for valuation, preferred shares. Most publicly traded preferred shares are issued at 25 bucks. Once they're on the market, the price will fluctuate a little bit, but if the preferred shares are callable, that means the company can buy them back at $25. For this reason, Callable preferred shares don't go much above $25. AGNCN was creeping up towards $26, so I trimmed some of those shares last month. If you want to know if a preferred share is callable, Quantum Online is a useful resource. Here you can see the call date was back in 2022, and in this paragraph it explains the terms under which it can be redeemed, which is just another word for call. I'll link it in the description, it's free. Now, this third signal is more dramatic and usually results in exiting the stock or fund completely. If there's a fundamental change that breaks my investment thesis, then I'm out. And by investment thesis, I just mean the reason I bought the investment. Theory is boring, so let's go to an example. I bought AFT earlier this year. I liked AFT. It was a credit fund focused on floating rate loans and it paid an 11%-ish, actually a little more than 11% yield. Then it merged with MFIC, which meant that all AFT shareholders would become MFIC shareholders. MFIC isn't just a different company, it's a different asset class. It's a business development company, not a fund. One look at MFIC's distribution history, and I could tell it's not for me. A history of distribution cuts is almost always a red flag. I exited AFT in July before my shares were converted to MFIC shares. Two other quick examples of fundamental change. First one is MPW. I held that before I started this channel, back when they had a solid reputation as a landlord in the healthcare sector. A large tenant named Stewart Healthcare had financial problems and the drama began. I exited MPW a couple of years ago because I no longer believed they were a competent and transparent landlord. MPW did bounce back recently, but the drama continues and I just don't like drama. Last example, ABR. I like Arbor Realty's business and I like their management. There were some negative short reports and I ignored those because they weren't credible. But as soon as I read the report of an FBI probe into ABR's financials, I sold. Like MPW, ABR's price has bounced back recently but there are still too many unknowns for me. Now, if the FBI probe finds that no formal investigation is warranted, then I'll happily consider buying back into ABR. The fourth and final reason for selling an income investment is to rebalance. In other words, a position increases in value so much that it becomes a larger share of the portfolio that I'm comfortable with. Admittedly, this doesn't happen very often because typically income investments don't go up that much. This year has been an exception. Now, when I bought HESM earlier this year, it went from less than 4% of my portfolio to more than 5% because it appreciated in value. I have a cap of roughly 5% on all my investments, so that put it on my radar for at least trimming the position back a little bit. 
In reality, there's often a combination of factors that lead to selling. For HESM, the appreciation meant that its weighing in the portfolio was too large, and also the yield was getting too low. So it was trimmed in July. I've been asked many times, why sell an investment that's paying you a high yield on cost? Say I bought an investment yielding 10%. The distributions didn't change, but the price doubled. My yield on cost would remain 10%, which sounds nice but I'd sell that investment. Why? Because yield on cost is looking back, I guess for you it would be that way, back in time, dividing today's income by the historical cost. My investment decisions aren't made while looking in the rearview mirror. I'm focused on today, specifically, what's my best alternative today? In the example I gave of an investment doubling in value, the yield on cost remains at 10%, but the current yield is only 5%. I would take that capital, which has doubled in size, and find another 10% yielding opportunity. The result is an increase in income, and increasing income is more important, at least to me, than maintaining a high yield on cost. To put it simply, in a world of 10% yield opportunities, and there are quite a few of those, holding an income investment that only yields 5% means foregoing that 5% difference and that can be a costly distraction, at least for an income investor. In the example I just gave, the income didn't change, nor did the yield on cost. If an income investment can increase its distributions, then the yield on costs can also increase over time, and that can be a good thing. If we look at Main Street Capital, they have a history of increasing their distributions. This yield on cost history chart shows that if you bought Main a year ago, the yield on cost was just over 8%. Not bad. Over the past year, Maine's distributions have increased from 23 cents to 24.5 cents per month, and they've paid out a ton of special distributions. The result is that the investor that bought Maine a year ago now has a higher yield on cost. It's gone up to 10%. So in summary, an increasing yield on cost can be a good thing, but just because the yield on cost is a big number, doesn't mean you should necessarily hold on to that investment. At least not for that reason. The point of this video wasn't to say copy my four reasons for selling. The point was to show that a growth investor and an income investor don't always approach selling decisions the same way. A growth investor focuses on the obvious stuff, the potential profit from a sale. But an income investor focuses more on the safety and the potential growth of the income stream from the portfolio. If you want to learn about those four tools I use for income investments that I mentioned earlier, things like price to book and total return charts, I'll link that video over here. That wraps it up for this look at when to sell income investments, more armchair income coming soon. Armchair income.